back everyone. Today we're going to turn our attention to chapter 10 and the discussion on stimulant type drugs. In our last lecture we focused on narcotic or opioid drugs and the effects that those depressants have on the human body. Today's lecture focuses on drugs with the opposite effect of narcotics. Let's go ahead and get started. To begin with, we know that stimulants are most commonly called uppers because of the effect that they have on our bodies. Essentially, they give you an increase in energy due to a release of dopamine that occurs throughout the body. Stimulants wake you up. These energize the body and they get you moving. These drugs can be licit or illicit in nature depending on the type of stimulant that we're discussing. Most of us use a stimulant of some kind on a daily basis. Are you tired from staying up late the night before? Have an extra large cup of coffee. Want a small pick-me-up? Get yourself a pop. These are licit recreational drugs that make us feel a little more awake and make us ready to take on the day. But if we're talking about more illicit types of drugs, those are going to be the ones that are scheduled as either a Schedule 1 or as a Schedule 2 type drug. Remember that Schedule 1 drugs have no recognized medicinal value and that Schedule 2 drugs are some, have some recognized medicinal value but still have a very high potential for abuse. Let's get started by discussing some of the more specific drugs that fall into the stimulant group by focusing our attention on amphetamines. Earlier on in the semester, we discussed the common use of amphetamines during World War II as a way to keep soldiers moving and marching for hours on end without getting tired. Towards the end of the war, Germany used them as a last ditch effort to try and keep their soldiers walking even when they were exhausted and Japan gave it to their kamikaze pilots right before they would go fly suicide missions for their empire. Amphetamines are also widely popular among truck drivers so that they can haul long trips at night and are a popular ingredient in some diet pills. A person who is taking an amphetamine drug masks their fatigue but often experiences a severe crash later on after the effects of the drug wear off. Therefore, you want to take more before that crash happens. Amphetamine use can be illicit or licit, but, all, but these drugs are all ones that do require a prescription to gain access to if you're not buying on the black market. Two of the most common types of amphetamine drugs, Ritalin and Adderall, are both big among college populations so that students can stay up all night working on papers or studying for exams but those are largely taken without prescription. Pharmacologically, they are meant to treat ADHD by increasing the patient's ability to focus and to pay attention. So if you need to be able to get a lot of work done in a hurry, you can imagine the appeal of this type of drug among those busy college students who have procrastinated and who have waited until the very last minute to get started on their work. So how do amphetamines work exactly? When you take an amphetamine drug, it creates a synthetic chemical experience similar to the natural release of norepinephrine, dopamine, and epinephrine. In the most basic terms, the release of norepinephrine is to mobilize the brain and body for action. Norepinephrine release is lowest during times in which we are asleep, it rises in times that we are awake, and it reaches much higher levels during situations of stress or danger in what has also been called the fight or flight response. In the brain, dopamine functions as a neurotransmitter, meaning that it is a chemical released by nerve cells to send, other, to send signals to other nerve cells. And finally, epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, is a medication, a hormone, and also a neurotransmitter. As a medication, it is used for a number of conditions including anaphylaxis, cardiac arrest, and superficial bleeding. Inhaled epinephrine may be used to improve the symptoms of croup. It also may be used for asthma treatment when other treatments are not effective. It is given intravenously, intramuscularly, by inhalation, or by injection just under the skin. So more of these chemicals are being released, but they are not being metabolized. So there's an increase in a pileup of these different chemicals in the body. This results in an increase of euphoria until our bodies finally begin to metabolize, metabolize the drug. Then the severe crash occurs. Stimulant drugs like amphetamines affect the peripheral nerve system, or the PNS, and is part of the, of the nervous system that consists of the nerves and ganglia outside of the brain and the spinal cord. The main functions of the PNS is to connect the central nervous system, or CNS, to the limbs and organs, essentially serving as a communication relay that goes back and forth between the brain and our extremities. 
These chemicals are released in the brain and then they're passed through the central nervous system and into the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nerve system is responsible for passing neurons throughout our bodies. Because our bodies are highly stimulated, a few things may occur when these drugs are consumed. First, fight or flight instincts often kick in at a high rate, meaning our natural desire to run away from or to confront possible threats. But the issue here is that we are synthetically experiencing this. So what if there are no threats? The drug makes you feel as though you still need to react this way and that can cause problems down the line. Your body, body typically feels a level of euphoria. Your whole body feels pleasure, but sometimes you may have a bad experience and the euphoria doesn't kick in the way that it used to. Instead, you may end up feeling anxious or feel panicked as a result of taking the drug. This can be described as a bad trip or a bad experience that is related to the consumption of the amphetamine. This can be attributed to a drug that is mixed with something else or is laced with an unknown substance. Finally, these drugs can often induce behavioral stereotyping in, in those who normally don't exhibit these behaviors. Behavioral stereotyping refers to the meaningless re repetition of a single activity. So if you look at this picture here on the screen, this would be similar to the repetition of flick flickering the lights on and off over and over and over again. So if we're taking them to create a recreational euphoric high, then what are these drugs really meant to treat? First, we have narcolepsy. Narcolepsy refers to the condition in which an individual falls asleep spontaneously. So if you're falling asleep, then let's wake you up and keep you awake. Next, as we already stated, these medications are often used to treat ADHD in children and in adults. Finally, these drugs can help with weight loss, but many drugs with amphetamines have been taken off the market because of the number of negative side effects that are associated with them. If you take an amphetamine, the drug will decrease the appetite center in the brain, which will make you want to eat less and subsequently lose weight. Like everything else, amphetamine use is not without a, a number of negative side effects. The largest and most dangerous side effects that come from stimulant use can be seen on your heart your blood pressure, and damage to blood vessels. The more you stress your heart and increase your blood pressure, eventually something is going to blow out. So if you take amphetamines too close together or for too long a time period, your blood pressure will get too high, resulting in a stroke. If your heart rate gets too high, you run the risk of a heart attack. If you remember from our conversations on opioid overdose, it, it is a much more peaceful type of overdose in comparison to stimulant overdose. Your body forgets to breathe and without oxygen, you eventually pass away. But with stimulants, the overdose is much more violent and hurts a lot more when the user dies. So while we're on the topic of amphetamines, let's take a quick look at the closely related cousin, methamphetamine. Once taken, methamphetamine actually breaks down and metabolizes into amphetamine. So individually, they're two different drugs, but are chemically very similar to one another. There are many other drugs in methamphetamine and a wide range of chemicals that can make this drug extremely potent and dangerous to use. Because of the way that meth breaks down into amphetamine, drug tests which show a presence of amphetamine are often considered a positive indication of methamphetamine use. Methamphetamines are commonly made from um, are commonly made by individuals in their own homes. Rather, it can be manufactured through using household items and over-the-counter ingredients. Namely, you need to get pseudoephedrine in order to create methamphetamine. You can purchase that at any drugstore, and you do not need a prescription to buy it. Pseudoephedrine is found in most antihistamines, and you're looking for the one with the letter D on the box. So Sudafed D has the higher amount of Sudafedrin in comparison to just regular Sudafed. Either way, it's regulated as we will discuss in more detail in just a second. Meth is easier to get and lasts longer than cocaine does. It comes in crystal form and you can smoke it. Methamphetamine is very volatile and a dangerous drug due to the chemicals that are used to create it. But if you don't know what you're doing, then it's really easy for meth to explode and you're essentially throwing chemicals everywhere. The same chemicals that you're using to create meth are also sitting in your body for quite a long time. And they're also working to corrode your teeth. That's one of the easiest ways in which we can identify a meth user, by their teeth. Meth breaks down your teeth and corrodes your gums pretty fast. We call this process meth mouth. 
Pseudoephedrine is still regulated at pharmacies and essentially when you go in to buy the product, they're going to run your driver's license through the computer. That regulation is a result of the Comprehensive Methamphetamine Control Act of 2008. This was originally passed in 1996 and then it was renewed in 2008. The Act accounts for the, precur or the, Act accounts for the precursor chemicals used to make methamphetamine. Ephedrine, pseudoephedrine, and phenylpropylamine. The statute also includes the following requirements for merchants who sell these products. First, they have to have a retrievable record of all purchases identifying the name and address of each party to be kept for two years. This is why they run your driver's license. They also have to require verification of proof of identity for all purchasers, showing that they did run your driver's license. And finally, they are required to have protection and disclosure methods in, per in the collection of personal information, meaning that they're not going to sell this to any outside parties and it's only used, used for their own record keeping. Because of these restrictions, people have, have felt the need to come up with newer ways to make meth. Essentially, they've created the term shake and bake meth. You do need to cook meth if you're going to make it the traditional way. However, you don't need a flame when you're making shake and bake. The lithium strips from a battery will serve as the cooking mechanism when you, when you shake and bake. So what does shake and bake mean? Think about the other things that you can shake and bake. Chicken, pork chops, any kind of meat, right? But how do you do it? You have to put it in a bag, put the seasoning in it, and then you shake it. Similar process here. Shake and bake, or one pot meth, needs less Sudafed and it can be made in a two liter. It is still highly explosive. As you can see here, the ingredients include pseud the Sudafed um, that we talked about earlier, iodized salt, a regular battery, you can see the energizers in the left hand corner, lighter fluid, heat, which is an antifreeze, um, sometimes this, this process will use acetone and hydrochloric acid, which is a very common chemical um, used in a lot of different cleaners, and you can just buy that at Home Depot or at Lowe's or some other supply store. And that's basically all you need here. Um, what you're going to do is get a two liter um, instead of a bag. You're going to get like a two liter pot bottle, as you can see in the picture here. And things that you need to know about Shake and Bake when you're doing this it's still highly volatile right so you're putting a lot of different chemicals together and you're tearing apart a lith a, a double a battery here if you take that double a battery and you peel the battery apart what you're going to find inside are different lithium strips and you're going to unroll the lithium from the battery you're going to tear it up and you're essentially just going to throw it in the pot bottle full of chemicals and that's how you're going to get things to start cooking so depending on how big of a batch you're making, it's generally going to take somewhere between one to five minutes to make shake and bake meth. So it's a pretty fast process in comparison to the traditional style of cooking. Here comes the big part of shake and bake. In a pot, when you're, when you're cooking it in this two liter pot bottle, you have to put the lid back on the bottle so the chemicals don't get out of the bottle, right? But by putting the lid on top, you're basically trapping all of those gases inside. So as you're shaking, you have to periodically unscrew the lid and allow for those gases to release. Otherwise, you're going to cause an explosion. On our course website, I've provided you a short video clip that actually shows you how shake and bake is, is made. So go watch it if you would like to see the process done for yourself. So now let's turn our attention to MDMA or ecstasy. This is one of those designer amphetamines that we began the lecture discussing. It is currently a Schedule One drug. It comes from a variety. It comes in a variety of different colors and has little faces or shapes and symbols on them. But this one is a little bit different compared to other stimulants that we've discussed so far in lecture. Ecstasy is part stimulant and part hallucinogen. This is what we call an enactogen because it releases both serotonin and dopamine from the brain. Ecstasy is called the love drug. Most ecstasy users are very affectionate and very happy and they also want to have a lot of sex while they take the drug. Ecstasy broadens your senses and often leaves you feeling very aroused. This slide shows you a picture of a variety of different ecstasy tablets. MDMA actually comes in a powder form. 
it's it's a white sort of powder and it's then manufactured and packed into pill form the different colors and logos on these pills signify um, or they represent rather the dealer that sells it so think about them almost like little illicit calling cards if you're taking the bright blue one with a smiley face on it then it came from this person and if you're taking the pink pill with the letter G on it then it came from this other person Ecstasy pills are sometimes mixed with other active substances, most commonly amphetamines, otherwise known as speed, caffeine, and ephedrine, a natural amphetamine-like substance. They also can contain ketamine sometimes, which was originally developed as a horse tranquilizer and is most commonly used as a date rape drug. Ecstasy is like combining an amphetamine with LSD. So you're going to have that stimulated feeling, but then also you're going to experience the hallucinations that can't come from a psychedelic drug. Ecstasy really became popular as a club drug. Young adults take ecstasy and then they go to a rave. The, high, the house style music, flashing lights, and all of these different things that happen at a rave have a sensory effect on the individual and almost overload the senses. But ecstasy doesn't come with the same crash that other types of amphetamines have, so it's very popular among club um, goers. Instead, the user experiences other types of side effects. Take a look at this picture here. What do these girls have in their mouths? They have pacifiers, like those that a baby would use. So why would somebody who's grown need a pacifier in their mouth at a club? Ecstasy makes you grind your teeth incessantly. The pacifier helps you to stop doing that in an effort to save your teeth. But what else happens to your body when you take ecstasy? What are some of the side effects and symptoms? We also discussed, we already discussed the idea of teeth grinding and you will also see a strong loss of appetite, muscle aches and stiffness, sweating, rapid heartbeat, feelings of anger or hostility, feelings of anxiety, and eventually altered sleep patterns if the drug is used routinely enough. One of the most persistent problems with MDMA use is that of hyperthermia, or heat stroke or overheating. This should not be confused with hypothermia, which is related to extreme cold weather. Several factors add to the effect of hyperthermia, including MDMA's pharmacological effect on increasing body temperature, the strong physical stimulation experienced by most users, and the euphoria and comfort of the experience that can cause users to overlook their level of exertion. Many ecstasy users have been told that they need to make sure that they're drinking enough water to stay on the safe side of the program problem rather but as a result some users encounter the somewhat less recognized problem of overhydration which causes um, or which we also can call water intoxication normally dependence can occur if the ecstasy user is using a lot of the substance but if it's just the recreational party or on the weekend then dependence is probably not as likely to occur Either way, ecstasy is often thought of as the smooth amphetamine because it does not normally have that strong crash that occurs after use. But if the user is dependent, then the biggest symptoms include depression and sleep dis disruption. In comparison to other drugs, this is not a bad withdrawal process at all. All right, on to cocaine. Cocaine use is not a new occurrence, and we've talked about it a few times in this semester already. We first saw a lot of cocaine being used in patent medicines, and then it became one of the very first drugs to be made illegal and regulated by the Harrison Act of 1914. But we still saw cocaine being used despite its illegality. It was not until the late 1970s and early 1980s that we saw cocaine really have its true resurgence. This became the drug of the 80s and was known as the disco drug. It comes in two main forms, powder and crack cocaine. It was a very glamorous drug and a lot of celebrities were known for using cocaine. But if you weren't somebody with money, then you, it, or I'm sorry, if you were somebody with money, then you wanted the powder. If you didn't have any money, then you often went for the crack. Crack was considered the poor man's version of the drug and was very popular in low income, largely minority neighborhoods. Pharmacologically, they are near identical in terms of their chemical composition. It is the materials that are used to cut the cocaine that cause problems and have an impact on how potent the drug really is. This occurs in much the same way that heroin is cut to extend the supply to as many buyers as possible. However, powder has 
less adulterants in it than crack does, but you can simply remove them and have a stronger version of cocaine if you wanted to. In terms of the composition of the drug and the methods of administration, crack is created when you take powder, you add a little bit of water and some baking soda to it. It crystallizes and forms a little crack rock. Now it's ready for smoking. You need less of the drug than if you were using powder. Now all you need to do is put it in a pipe, add a heat source, and off you go. Powder you end up snorting, and crack you either inject or you smoke. Freebasing became very popular in the 1980s and kept on being popular due to fears regarding HIV AIDS like we discussed in regards to heroin. People didn't want to inject and then they figured out that freebasing can provide a better, quicker high, sometimes even better than intravenous drug use. Freebasing occurs when you take powder cocaine, you add a liquid base to it, oftentimes this is either sodium carbonate or ammonium hydroxide. The cocaine will then dissolve along with all of its impurities. You can add petroleum or ethyl ether to extract the cocaine. The cocaine then floats to the top of the solution and all you need to do is take an eyedropper and draw it out of the chemical solution. You then let that substance dry and it will crystallize. Once it's crystallized, you can then simply crush it into a powder and smoke that. Although powder and crack are pharmacologically similar, crack is considered worse and more dangerous because it often induces a quicker high. When you smoke a drug and it enters your lungs, the high is almost instantaneously, instantaneous rather. Therefore, people enjoy it more because of the release of dopamine that happens quicker and it is often stronger than powder cocaine that you have to snort. Crack cocaine was always associated with low-income minority individuals until this man came along. This is a picture of Len Bias. For those of you who are not familiar, Len Bias was a University of Maryland student, but not just any student. He was a star basketball player who had been drafted in the first round of the NBA draft by the Boston Celtics. Less than 48 hours after he was drafted, he died from a cocaine overdose, but he didn't use powder. He overdosed on crack cocaine and it was causing a firestorm up in Washington. Immediately after Bias's overdose, a large Republican Congress moved to push through more extensive legislation that built upon the 1984 crime control measures that introduced and implemented mandatory minimums regarding illicit drug use through the United States. Len Bias was a terrific basketball player, but is known mainly now for his overdose and for becoming one of the biggest figureheads surrounding the war on drugs focused efforts on cocaine use. The legislative result of Bias's death was the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986, which further extended mandatory minimums, asset forfeiture related to drug use, and loads of other drug, drug war goodies. The Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986 was part of the war on drugs that was passed by the United States Congress. M among other things, they changed the system of federal supervised release from a rehabilitative system into a punitive one. The 1986 Act also prohibited controlled substance analogs. The bill enacted new mandatory minimum sentences for drug use, including marijuana. In terms of cocaine use, this act mandated a minimum sentence of five years without parole for the possession of five grams of crack cocaine. In addition, it, manded, it mandated the same sentence for possession of 500 grams of powder cocaine. This 100 to 1 ratio disparity was eventually reduced to an 18 to 1 ratio disparity when crack was in increased to 28 grams or one ounce by the Fair Sentencing Act of 2010 that occurred under the Obama administration. In this lecture, we focused on a few different types of stimulant-based drugs. Some are stronger than others in terms of addiction and withdrawal. Even though they may vary, they share similar effects, including increased heart rate, blood pressure, damage to blood vessels, and if overdose occurs, it will happen in a much more violent way in comparison to opioid-based drugs as discussed last time we met. Thank you for your attention today, and I, I will meet you back here next time when we begin our discussion on tobacco use in Chapter 11 of your textbook. Have a great day, and thank you very much.